struggling with my mask. I couldn't get it off. I welcome you here to St. John this morning. Whether it's your first time or you've been here many times, you are welcome here. A few announcements. Um, and then, actually, um, there's someone joining us, Nathan, um, and he's going to speak to you in, in just, a, just a few minutes, but I want to um, just highlight a, a couple things. So, we're not doing this yet, but at the beginning of November, we're going to change how we sign in. So, our, our books that have served us well for the, the last probably 18 months, or at least year, are no longer doing the job that we want them to which means that people aren't using them to sign in. So why do we sign in? What's important about that? Well, number one, it helps us know who was here, especially if someone's visiting for the first time. We can send them a note. We can welcome them by name. Um, but it also helps us know who was here in, as the pandemic continues in case we have information to let you know. So th that's, those are two very good reasons to, uh, to keep track of who is here at worship. We're going to do it in a different way with, I call this the welcome book, um, and they'll be in each pew. They have an insert that you'll sign, and you'll pass the book to your neighbor. They'll sign, and at offering, sheet gets ripped out and put in the offering plate. That way, the, the staff in the office and myself can, again, welcome anyone who might be here for the first time Someone who may have a prayer request that they uh, indicate maybe they want like a call, um, all those things. And one of the things I have found, maybe unintended, but it works, there's occasions when you sit next to someone in the pew and you're not quite sure who they are, and maybe you think, I really should know who they are, you look at where they signed and you know their name. So it's a good thing all around, and we're going to do it starting the first weekend in November. And speaking of November, our annual meeting is in November. It will be on November 14th. It will follow the worship service, just really streamlined right into annual meeting from worship. Um, and prior to that meeting, there will be a couple of sessions for questions, if anyone has them. Our reports are already out on our Welcome Center ledge, and on Saturday, November 6th at 4.30, or Sunday, November 7th, Following the service at 10, George Johnson and myself will be available. Um, actually, it'll be George on the 7th. But I'll be here on the 6th for any questions you may have about budgets, about the direction of ministry, um, your thoughts, your concerns. Those are a time to bring all of those prior to the annual meeting when we all gather. Third announcement. Worship board is meeting right after the service in the what used to be the library is now sort of the, the conference room, the meeting room with the big table. Um, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things, including, hard to believe, Christmas Eve. Um, so those things are coming up. And as we think about things getting cold, it's been our habit, and it's a great one, to keep the doors um, the front doors open as people come in to church, but with the cold air beginning, I had frost on my window. Um, we're going to keep those closed now just because it keeps the heat in and the greeters don't freeze and it's um, efficient for us. So those are the announcements I have. I'd like to invite Nathan to come on up um, to the lectern where there is a wonderful microphone to talk a little bit more about Thrivent. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, like Pastor said, my name is Nathan Braun. I'm a financial advisor with Thrivent here in Reesburg. And Thrivent is a nonprofit financial services organization that helps Christians be wise with money so they can live a generous life. Uh, let me ask you something. By a show of hands, does anyone here know if they are a Thrivent member? All right, a few hands going up. So, I will be in the back of church uh, after church. I got some Dunkin' Donuts there. There's be some coffee. And I'm going to talk with you about Thrivent Choice Dollars and Thrivent Action Teams. And I don't know if everyone knows about those, but they are a uh, benefit of being a member of Thrivent. And they are a way that you can make an impact here at St. John's and in your community. And uh, not everyone is always aware of that. So I wanted to share that with you. And I wanted to thank Pastor and Ben Berg for inviting me to come talk with you today. So uh, 
I look forward to uh, talking with you after church. Uh, feel free to stop by. I got a table back there. Like I said, there's some donuts, and uh, I don't want to take them home and eat them, so please, please take them. Thank you. Uh, you, may, you may not know, or you may know, that um, some of these action teams have been at work here at St. John. In fact, for the Advent service that's coming up um, on the second Sunday in the later afternoon, the choir, the bell choir, um, all of us will get together. Uh, some of that um, action team um, uh, resources are going to help us have a meal afterwards. So, um, so just really great things that help us be more faithful and help us be more connected. So... Looking forward to that. See, no other announcements. I invite you now to stand. Those who are able to rise in body and spirit for our call to worship. We are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit to know and proclaim Jesus Christ and as disciples reach out in love. Let us worship the Lord. Let us now confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But by the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is 673, either in the hymnal or on the screens. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Eternal light, shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal compassion, have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face and enable us to reflect your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It is time for the choir to sing. For the evening, or the evening, it's not evening, it's morning, the morning readings.
A reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsively Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among nations, the Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who sow out weeping, carrying the seeds, will come again with joy, shall bring their sheaves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Teacher, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. This week's gospel features kind of a carryover from last week's gospel, right? Jesus asking, what can I do for you? But this week's gospel story is also a healing story. It's maybe one of the more famous ones in the New Testament. A blind man named Bartimaeus sits by the roadside begging for alms, for a few coins, maybe a bit of food. And as Jesus and a large crowd pass by, the man begins to shout Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those standing nearby, well, they try to get him to be quiet. They try to shut him up. But their reprimand prompt Bartimaeus to shout louder. Finally, Jesus stops. Jesus stands still and asks the same people who had just 
scolded the blind man to lead him forward. And they do. They say to Bartimaeus, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And Bartimaeus throws off that cloak and springs up. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says, teacher, let me see again. Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, the gospel writer tells us, Bartimaeus regains his sight and follows Jesus on the way. There's that story again. It's beautiful. It's a a layered story, in part about healing, but about other things as well. And I want to talk about those other things this morning. I love in this story that Jesus heals first, think about this, the crowd around Bartimaeus. Well, what do I mean by that? How does Jesus heal the crowd? Well, Bartimaeus is someone who this crowd probably has passed by, individuals together with their families. However, they've probably passed by him a number of times in their daily walks, right? Going about their business. They've passed by him, but they haven't seen him. Though Bartimaeus is literally the blind man in the story, it's the crowd, the blind man's friends, his peers, his culture, his society that render him unseen. To their seeing eyes, the blind man by the roadside is invisible, expendable. His shouts and his cries are not worthy of attention, his suffering not important enough to warrant patience, tenderness, maybe even curiosity. Bartimaeus, why are you here by the road every day? When the invisible one then dares to speak out, the crowd's first inclination is to make him be quiet, to shut him down, reestablish the social hierarchy, really, the status quo that, that keeps it's comfortable to go about your everyday business, even passing the beggar by the side of the road. But that comfort is precisely what Jesus renders impossible. And once the crowd sees Bartimaeus, they cannot unsee him. Once Jesus opens their eyes to his humanity, they respond with compassion. They say, take heart, get up. He's calling you. I don't know for sure, but I suspect that Jesus heals the crowd first so they can, in turn, participate in Bartimaeus' healing. What the blind man needs is not physical sight alone. He needs visibility, validation within his community. And in what becomes a double miracle story, Jesus grants him both the community and his own sight. I love that Bartimaeus, in his blindness, sees what the crowd does not. He calls Jesus, maybe, maybe you noted this in the story, he calls Jesus son of David. Now this is a title that Jesus has not made public in his ministry. The Gospels make clear that Jesus' true identity remains mostly hidden from people until after the resurrection. Even the disciples, they struggle to understand who and what their teacher really is. Maybe, maybe it's because they're busy, busy seeing what they want to see in Jesus, right? A, a magician, a politician, a military leader, a carpenter's son, a wise man. But this blind man, free of all those filters, discerns quickly that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of God. We might say then that this is one of those rare and beautiful moments in the Gospels when Jesus himself is truly seen. Bartimaeus sees Jesus as holy and purely as Jesus sees him. 
The gaze and the recognition are mutual. I wonder, I wonder if Jesus stops and stands still precisely, precisely because the blind man surprises and delights him. Teacher, I see you. And then I love that Bartimaeus, he throws off that cloak. I mean, think about the cloak for him. The cloak is something that, that covers him, keeps him warm, offers him a little bit of security, and, and the cloak is how he gathers his livelihood, right? He may sleep all huddled inside, and then in the morning he gets up and he, he spreads it out so people can throw their coins on it. At the end of the day, he gathers it up and wraps himself in it again. I am in awe of the trust that Bartimaeus has in Jesus by the end of the story, a trust that is deep enough for him to cast aside what's most familiar and safe, that cloak, in exchange for a way that's new and maybe full of uncertainty. Bartimaeus puts on a new identity when he sheds his cloak. He is, in essence, born again. And finally, finally, I love that Jesus asks Bartimaeus to articulate his heart's desire, right? He says, what do you want me to do for you? It's kind of a bizarre question. I mean, it should be obvious, right? Bartimaeus wants Jesus to help restore his sight. He's a blind beggar. How hard can it be to figure out what he wants? But Jesus asks anyway. He does not presume. He doesn't reduce Bartimaeus to his blindness instead. Instead, he honors the fullness and complexity of the real human being that Bartimaeus is, who has desires and longings and needs beyond just the blindness. And in asking the question, Jesus invites Bartimaeus to reflect honestly, what do you need? For growth and healing, what's in your heart? What do you long for? Where in your deepest desire might we find each other? It's a lovely and terrifying question to be asked what you need, isn't it? It can call for radical honesty and trust and vulnerability. What do you really need? This story has me reflecting on my time spent working with hospice. And in hospice, the things that come before, mostly, before people elect to use a service like hospice, are those first questions, right? How can I be healed? Where is the cure? How can I get better? Mostly, not always, but mostly by the time that patients and families come to be cared for by hospice, those questions have changed. They're different. No less important, though, how can I have comfort for even a small part of my day? How can I spend good quality time with my family talking about important things? The goal changes, but the question is always there. What can we do for you? That's what hospice, nurses, and spiritual and grief counselors, and social workers, and CNAs do. The same question that Jesus asks Bartimaeus. What can I do for you? And when we're asked that question, no matter where we are in our life, we are always encouraged to answer as honestly, as vulnerably, with trust as we can. When Jesus, maybe in the form of a neighbor or a pastor or even a stranger, asks you, what can I do for you? Consider it seriously. It's how we connect and how Jesus lives out and the gospel plays out for us. Amen.
this morning, we will sing as our hymn of the day, Amazing Grace. It's number 779 in your hymnal. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5. I invite you to stand, to rise, those who are able, as with the whole church, we confess our faith, the words found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all God's creation. Risen One, we give you thanks for congregations and ministries throughout the world that serve as centers of prayer and action. Empower missionaries, teachers, healers, evangelists, and all who are sent to share your song of joy. Hear us, O God. Holy One, we give you thanks for generous land that produces abundant harvest. Strengthen and protect all soils from rooftop gardens to prairie farmlands to patio planters, to fertile valleys. Bless all who lovingly tend them. Hear us, O God. <laughs> Ruling one, we give you thanks for leaders of nations who work to build up the common good. Strengthen efforts of reconciliation among all nations. The peace extends in every direction. Hear us, O oh God. <laughs> Healing one, we give you thanks for all who labor for the health of others. Comfort and strengthen all who struggle with chronic pain. Send healing, relief, and peace to all who are sick. Hear us, O oh God. 
In keeping with God's commandment to pray and celebrate with others, we keep in mind these who celebrate their birthday this month. We pray for Bonnie and for Jesse. We remember Nick and Janelle. And hold close to our heart Lorna May in Denver. And in partnership, the mission and ministry of Zion Lutheran Church, Rock Springs. Hear us, O God. Providing one, we give you thanks for all who provide for others. Inspire generosity in your people so that we carry out the work of making disciples of all nations. Hear us, O God. Living one, we give you thanks for the saints who have increased our faith. Give us courage to follow in hope until you gather us all around your table of abundance. Hear us, O God. Confident that you do hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated as we go ahead and take our morning offering. Let us pray, holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life and so with all of the choirs of angels with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us now pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst come, the table is ready. You may be seated. This morning, we will receive communion up front. It's like, it's like the drum roll. <laughs> because you're all welcome to come up. And Bob will be the communion assistant. He and I will have both bread and um, the juice. So you will receive a wafer. You can take and eat it right away. We have a gluten-free alternative. If you need, just simply let me know. And, it, and, and please do let me know, because otherwise I don't always remember. This happened last night. And once you have received the wafer, you may proceed to Bob. Bob will have a tray in the tray or little cups. Some cups have dark-colored wine. Some have light-colored juice. Simply indicate to Bob which one you would prefer. You may then take and drink. And then at either end are baskets to put your cup in when you are done. Come, for it is all ready.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our sending hymn this morning is number 820, O Savior, Precious Savior. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 